John Jennings is professor, author, graphic novelist, curator, Harvard fellow, New York Times bestseller, 2018 Eisner winner and all around champion of black culture. As professor of media and cultural studies at the University of California at Riverside, uh, Jennings examines the um, visual culture of race in various media forms, including film, illustrated fiction, and comic and graphic novels. His research interests include the visual culture of hip hop, Afrofuturism, and politics. Visual literacy, horror, and ethnographic and speculative design, and its application to visual rhetoric. Uh, and I will also say that John Jennings is the other half of uh, Black Kirby. Uh, in, if you have not had a chance to get to the Hurston Museum, you should really go and see the Black Kirby exhibit uh, that features the work of John Jennings and Stacey Robinson. And as I said before, not only is it just visually stunning, uh, but it is informative and transformative. It's a wealth of, of information in the exhibit. Uh, and so you should really go and check it out. So without uh, any more, uh, taking up any more of your time, we'll give you to John Jennings. Here your floor is all yours, Mr. Jennings. Thank you, thank you so much um, for that very kind uh, introduction and um, the very kind words about the, uh, about the Black Kirby Show. It's our 10th anniversary um, of, of working together. Is that Walter Grayson? <laughs> I'm sorry. That's what it was. It's good to see you, brother. Anyway, um, yeah. So, yeah, just, we haven't seen each other forever, right? So, um, I want to thank I want to thank the Zona Hurston Festival, Julian Shambliss, um, everyone responsible for uh, putting this wonderful uh, uh, show together. I know how difficult it is in these COVID times. So, um, I'm going to try to be as succinct as possible, but I want to talk to you today about a construction that I've been working on called Critical Race Design Studies, um, which is coming out of the speculative design practice. So I'm going to go ahead and sh share my screen. And uh, so today's talk um, that I'm focused on is called Race by Design. And I got this idea. Uh, from just my background as a design uh, researcher and as a and a design historian, um, for the last like oh before I just took this position, I, I took top of like twenty years as a graphic designer um, at various posts in design history, design methodology, and one of the things that, that I kept thinking about is like the fact that these particular processes that we're learning, the pedagogy that we're teaching, are coming from a very Eurocentric background. So I was always trying to figure out well, what is the black aesthetic like? How is how is blackness being articulated, you know, and that's kind of like where the 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 where I kind of started. So that idea of using like the black body as, for instance, a, a grid to to think about like where where type would go, for instance, something very similar, sim simple and formal, right? Um, one of the things that really really excited me fairly recently is this discovered that W. B. Du Bois actually was a designer. He actually did these wonderful uh, information graphics based off his sociological research. And he would actually do, do these hand done uh, information graphics. So I would say that, again, du, du Bois is a pioneer in what I would now call critical race design studies. And I'll get into that. Um, so one of my favorite uh, uh, conversations from the late great Charles Mills from the, from the racial contract is this this statement about the nature of race and how um, and, and, I, and racialized identity, and this is some of the things that you started me thinking about, like it as a designed object or something that is um, this type of, a, a deliverable. We have this term called a deliverable. So when you're working on design projects, you have an end goal or you have an end result, and it's called a de deliverable. It can be a system or it could be some type of object or what have you, but it's always like you know generated at, to to answer a question. So anyway, he says, there will be white mythologies, invented Orients, invented Africas, invented Americas with a correspondingly fabricated population. Countries that never were, inhabited by people who never were. Calibans and Tontos, Man Fridays and Sambos, but who attain a virtual reality through their existence in traveler's tales, folk myth, popular and highbrow fiction, colonial reports, scholarly theory, Hollywood cinema, and they're living in the white imagination and determinedly imposed upon their alarmed real life counterparts. 
And so, it, so it, what he's talking about is the kind of, kind of like this disruption of, of, of black agency, right? To decide, you know, what your body even should be or, or, or your identity should even be. Of course, this is building off of Franz Fanon's work too, correct? Um, critical race design studies I define as an interdisciplinary design practice that intersects critical race theory. Oh, there's that term. <laughs> Just kidding. Speculative design, uh, design history, and critical making to analyze and critique the effects of visual communication, graphic objects, and their associated systemic mediations on racial identity. Um, so I was thinking about this particular project in four, in four parts, to analyze and interpret and critique the formal graphic indexes of racial oppression in our visual culture landscape. So that means looking at like stereotypes or you know, these types of things. Um, to study the underlying theories and design-oriented rationales for racial oppression, how to disrupt, disrupt or retire them from use. And when I come from, so this idea of retiring from use, I come at from like, we can redesign a cell phone like every three months, right? Or we can always have like, we can redesign shoes, you know, for every season, you know, pick colors for every season, but we can't actually disrupt the, the, the systems of oppression because these are designed objects too, you know? Design means to plan. It doesn't necessarily have to be this, um, you know, the, uh, this this fashion design idea or like this car design idea. These are systemic issues, right? And I realize, and I, I believe that every issue in our culture that we're dealing with are design are designed are design problems essentially. To um, to study the the, uh, the racially oppressed, um, how the racially oppressed have reappropriated these indexes and theories for liberation and resistance and to create new designs and narratives that uplift the oppressed body identity and to create and disseminate deliverables that critique and expose racial oppression. So those are the different tenets. Um, you know, I was thinking about uh, this idea of the black body being a, um, a text. You know, this is going back to, to the racial con contract uh, statement where I think pretty much everybody's familiar with the scene and roots where uh, Kunta Kinte is being transformed into Toby, right? He's literally being rewritten with the with a master's whip, right? With a with a, with a slaveholder's whip, where his his very identity is 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 at risk, you know. Um, there's a scene we're talking about, you know. So rewriting history, the collective text of the black body has been reinscribed many times over, much like a palimpsest. So there's this term, the, the palimpsest from design history, where palimpsest is a piece of parchment which is like animal hide that is reused over and over again, right? And you can see them, you can, you know, you can see like where, where the old uh, writing has been erased or rubbed out, um, right? And not just three fifths of the history, right? All the history. So there's this thing that I call, call a Kuntobi moment in this particular scene. There's a, scene, there's a, there's a point in this, particular, in this particular scene where he is both Kunta Kente and Toby simultaneously, right? And that's, and then there's a moment where he decides that his survival is more important than holding on to that particular name, realizing, you know, in this painful moment that he he's always going to be Kunta Kente, but he has to hide his his identity in Toby in order to survive, right? And this is how Black people have survived, you know, through these different naming uh, um, conventions that have happened throughout history, right? As DJ Spooky says, as you process words, they process you. And you know this idea of branding, right? This is a typographic element. Some of these brands are actually quite lovely as far as like design goes. So we're looking at like the formal qualities of what design looks like, and then how you know something as um, as beautiful as the calligraphy on a on a slave document actually you know can destroy people's lives. So throughout history, you know, we talk about this idea of typography. Typography is a is a prosthetic of control because it actually names things, it gives forms to ideas. Machines take on the morality of their inventors. That's a Mary Baraka technology and ethos. So, of course, we're very much, uh, uh, you know, um, familiar with apartheid. Uh, we're familiar with, uh, you know, these documents that are of like, you know, slave sales. These are all typographically designed elements. This, this is actually the what I'm talking about is the is the manifestation of a particular type of like design uh, impetus that manifests itself as this destructive document, you know. Uh, typography and printing were extremely powerful tools in the mutation of people into property, right? And these are just uh, images of like slave documents. And so this is where my where head was going. Well, as someone who was being trained to teach students about design, you know, how has design been culpable in 
you know, destroying people's lives, upending, disrupting these types of ideas, demarcating space, you know, these types of things during like the Jim Crow era, we see some signs like that too. So visual, this is what Jennifer Gonzalez says, uh, visual uh, ephemera can be considered a part of the truth effect. Type image naturalize ideological systems by making them visible. Um, and yeah, and that's what happens is, right, these ideas get naturalized. You know, racism as a, as a construction has been naturalized. It's not a real thing, right? It's a construction. And we always talk about like, well, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's, it's a designed construction. I'm, well, as a designer, I'm like, well, I want to see the blueprints because you know, I'm whole, I'm like, well, if you can actually like disrupt or, or remake race or these ideas, then why not do it? And my whole thing is like, it must be serving a particular purpose because, you know, design is created, you know, for a particular thing. Stereotypes are created to function in a particular way. They have particular, uh, um, you know, connotations. Um, race is, has been an important visual system of power whose parameters have been the focus of every innovation in visual recording devices, right? And that's something I found very interesting. Um, this idea of race in space too. Uh, I'm sure you, you're, you're familiar with the idea of the sundown town, right? And of course, there's a there's a town in Illinois called Anna, uh, which is a uh, some people say is a, as an abbreviation for a particular uh, uh, statement. Ain't no n words allowed, for instance. Um, the idea, for instance, that during slavery, that slave owners thought there was a thing called kitchen heaven, right? Which is something that fascinates me as well. We're talking about the conflation of space and identity, even in death in the afterlife. You know, slave owners were like, "Well, do my slaves have souls? Will they be there?" If they're there, will they still be my slaves? Or is there a segregated space called kitchen heaven where they will go? And this is real, right? Uh, this is how race as an idea has like permeated our culture and has been naturalized through, through typography through all these different ways of thinking about design. And this is what I'm getting at as far as like using critical race design studies as a way to kind of unpack these notions. And that's what I think about this idea of black letters, right? Their racialized letters, MLK, KKK, NAACP, the letter N itself these days is a racialized letter. Even the letter X, you know, has these kind of racialized components to it. And I think what's happened is that artists have been trying to like signify and flip the script and actually start creating their own designs. Like for instance, I think about the vernacular signage of like uh, boycotts and, and, and signs of resistance. I think about the abolitionist logo, am I not a man and a brother? These are particular uh, design aesthetics that actually kind of like that that visual artists have have used throughout throughout history to kind of like uh, deploy. For instance, someone like Amos Paul Kelly Kennedy, who was once an IBM uh, computer programmer, who decided to become a <laughs> to become a, a a printmaker. Right, there's these beautiful uh, printmakers. These this haul around a print a printmaking uh, a print uh, you know a printer you know old school print, uh, printing press in the back of a truck and make these beautiful signs. But, but he's using the vernacular of like blues posters and like, you know, uh, signs of resistance, right? And then mind you, these are considered quote unquote fine artists who are using typography. To me as a designer, I'm like, well, if you're using image and text then you're designing something because you're, you're, you're making the work really, really didactic. Like you're trying to get to, get to a point um, you know, really quickly when you use text and image, right? Which is what attracts me to comics anyway, because it's pure graphic design. So this is Karen A. Weems's work, right? <laughs> Somebody wants to know about credit for attending. Uh, let me see here. Sorry, I just saw in the Q and A. <laughs> hey, Willis Thomas. You know, who I feel like to me is like, um, uh, he's Deborah Willis's son, first of all, the great De Deborah Willis uh, photog uh, photographic historian. Um, his background really is kind of like a design background. He's, he's using visual rhetoric to remix and rethink how text is deployed. So uh, see, he's, he's, he's making these like really, really critical uh, uh, juxtapositions between like, you know, the, uh, the types of like auctions that would happen or, or, or like the, uh, the types of, um, you know, uh, slave, uh, fugitive slave postings and how it juxtaposes with like the NBA draft, that kind of thing, very interesting. Or, or like using the vernacular of, um, you know, of design to really, really talk about like how it, how it imprints itself onto us, on our society. Fine, really, really interesting work. 
And Glenn Ligon is another fine artist that I feel is actually utilizing typography and design aesthetics to kind of upend how we look at both, you know. And of course, um, the quote unquote lynching museum uh, for peace and justice, right? Uh, I think is using um, design aesthetics in a particular way that I think are really, really powerful. These are modernist design aesthetics that are actually intersecting with like a really, really radical social statement. And of course, um, the collection project, we're collecting like spaces where people have been, been lynched. This is using typography and design as a way to, to, to remember the dead and to actually think about justice differently. Um, but this idea is that, you know, design is always kind of like demarcated space, race, you know, um, identity, class is not a new idea, right? Um, as DJ Spooky says, we have machines to repeat hi history for us. Even things like this, I remember I was I was traveling one day and, I, and I, I'm not a sports fan. I didn't know who I didn't know who uh, Jadeveon Clowney was. I don't even know if he's still in the, in the NFL. All I knew is that there was this this uh, this beautiful black man, right, that was being literally labeled with things like scary. He's a freak. Runs like a deer. He's unstoppable. These are different. I mean, I know that there, there was supposed to be like you know uh, hyperbolic you know uh, conversations about his his ability as an athlete. But you know, if he's running like a deer and he's a male deer, then he's a buck, right? That that actually is a that's a, that's a stereotypical naming convention right there. That's that's plain as day. And maybe they don't know these histories, but I do, and we do. Um, or the idea of our of, of our former president having to show his birth certificate. You know, slaves when they left when they left the plantation would have to show papers, right? It's just these particular ideas of like how how printed ephemera and design would um, affected us, right? This is a this is a redlining map. This is this is a, um, a a physical manifestation of racialized oppression as a as a graphic object. That's what that is. And the idea of legibility is something that's really interesting to me too. Like what types of bodies are legible? Legibility is a design concern. What things are legible when we look at them, right? So this leads me to think about a lot about my own work where, you know, some of the first uh, instances that I, that I started doing around like reclaiming these particular images, uh, using art and critical making to really look at, um, you know, how the black body is being like, is, is being created and destroyed and, 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 and given back to us, right? So this is a series called Matters of the Fact that I did, oh my goodness, back in 2008. This is when I first started thinking about Afrofuturism as a space to work in, where I was thinking about the fleshy parts of the body you know, of the cyborg is a cybernetic organism from science fiction as the real black body and the constructed space, you know, being like the, um, being the, uh, uh, the, the metallic systems that kind of like control our bodies, right? So there's a, this is about 70 or so images where I'm thinking about stereotyping, I'm thinking about, you know, um, just the visual oppression of, 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 of how black people are treated just visually, you know, uh, and that's what these came from. And then, of course, when I started doing some research on Afrofuturism, I realized that there was an entire, like, just a cavalcade, a system of information out there that I didn't even know about. Like, you know, The Last Angel of History. This is a, a, a film by John Acomfra, um, basically, uh, of, you know, some of Af African immigrants who lived, who grew up in, 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 the, in the UK. This particular piece came out in 1997. And it's a, a, document, a documentary about Black digital music and, and, and science fiction and technology. And at the beginning of it, he introduces a couple of things. One is the idea of the data thief, you know, so that this is a data thief. And so the data thief, he, he posits, is this time traveling archeologist that's trying to actually put together uh, connections between black creative culture, particularly music culture. And he talks about uh, the Robert Johnson mythology of him going down to the crossroads, selling his soul to the quote unquote devil uh, and basically becoming a, virtuos a, a virtuoso on the blues guitar. And what he used, what he says though, is he gives he gives Robert Johnson the quote unquote devil gives Robert Johnson a black secret technology, and he calls it the blues. And it blew my mind because I never really thought about music as a technology. But really, if you think about the definitions of it, you know, um, technology are these are these ways of actually like using various systems as um, appendages or uh, different types of like ways of knowing. You know, and music definitely is a way of knowing. So I actually created this series called um, uh, Thief at the Crossroads, which is a series of blues uh, uh, portraits. 
And he's actually debuted at Jackson State University, my alma mater, where I used to teach as well. So little by little, I started to do more and more work with Afrofuturists, and, and I ended up being in the right sp space at the right time. And a lot of the images I created are now like some of the more well-known aesthetic representations of what they call Afrofuturism. It's a bunch of work that I've done over the last, I don't know, decade or so. And then I started to realize that there were like people who are on the ground organizers who are part of the, the movement for Black Lives or like, you know, really trying to upend the prison industrial complex, uh, what have you, different types of social reform. But they're also writing and making science fiction. And I was like, oh, OK, well, to me, it's the Black speculative arts movement. And this is, you know, I actually like tweeted this out. You can see like it was retweeted twice, had three likes. But now the Black Speculative Arts Movement is an international movement. You know, so what I was saying is that this is what's happening right now. I think that you know that um, Afrofuturism, Black Speculative culture, is the current mode of Black resistance in a visual and performing form. You know, I, I, I do believe that. Um, that led me and my friend Stacy Robinson to start thinking about um, design fictions like Black History, uh, like Black Kirby. Black Kirby is a design fiction piece where we are actually like you know, basically using the avatar of Black Kirby uh, as a way to talk about music, politics, comics, popular culture, and to critique all those things too. The idea is that if Jack Kirby, the great Jack Kirby was um, was a Black man living in, in, in the same space in an alternative space, what types of work would he make? So it's just an ongoing project that we've been doing for the last decade. A lot of it's about remix, rejuxposition, thinking about Black utopias. And what's happened is we've ended up creating like a a whole system of, of artists and creators who think this way. And it's been pretty exciting, you know, and very, very grateful for the work that Stacey and I have been able to do together. So I'm gonna get through these pretty quickly because I wanna make sure we have time for questions and stuff. This is about 130 or so works from the original Black Kirby show. Uh, incidentally, we're going to we're getting ready to have our 10th anniversary show. It's called Black Kirby X, and it's going to be here in Riverside at the uh, Kohler Arts Center. So really quickly, I want to talk about this notion of design fictions and diegetic prototypes, right? Um, incidentally, Bruce, Ser Bruce Sterling is one of the, he's one of the founding fathers of like cyberpunk, which I found really interesting. He did this uh, really uh, seminal collection of cyberpunk science fiction stories. Uh, called Mirror Shades, which is like actually one of the foundational cyberpunk uh, collections. But he's also a designer and he does a lot of design research. And so a lot of times when designers, uh, particularly like uh, in industrial designers are doing this work, they do what they call diegetic prototypes. Or um, So instead of actually making something that's supposed to be sold on the market, you take a design problem and then you, 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 you think about possibilities and you'll make a prototype in your studio that answers the question because design is about answering questions. It's about what who's using it, you know, what what design is actually plausible, those types of things. And we <clears throat> we're like mad scientists. We'll go and go into a laboratory instead of writing a paper about something, we'll make something, right? And a design fiction is something that creates these story worlds, right? So <clears throat> excuse me. So basically the 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 um the focus of a of a design fiction is not to necessarily be you know, put put together on, on an open market and sold to to consumers, it is created to have a conversation. So it's it's discursive in nature, right? And speculative design is the same kind of thing. It's, it's like how is speculative design uh, utilizing speculative work? So when I say speculation, I'm talking about stuff like science fiction, fantasy, horror, these different types of story modes. How does that affect you know design fiction? So if you look at like science fiction movies and stuff. These are all things that are positing what a future could look like, right? It's utilizing like social forces and manifesting them as like designed objects. Really, really interesting work. And then when I started thinking about it, I was like, well, you know how in race kind of like a, a speculative design piece because it's not a real thing, but it's affected society. Um, if to borrow from Isvan Sassoni Rone's book, uh, The Seven Beauties of Science Fiction, race kind of acted like a fictive nova, what, the, the new thing, you know? If you look at like science fiction narratives, like for instance, if you have like uh, something like a uh, uh, time cop, right? Time, time travel has become like a ubiquitous thing that actually needs to be policed. That's a very interesting idea. Um, and what happens is like that new thing, that fictive novum, it actually changes society and then creates different types of technologies around that thing. And then you have to have like neologisms, literally like new language to talk about those fictive novums. So you have to come up with like 
you know, uh, systems that actually support that fictive novum. And that's what happened with race. That would happen with slavery, right? Anyway, I, I, that's, that's kind of a different talk. But anyway, uh, uh, so I, I was teaching this class called Race as Science Fiction because that's what it is. <laughs> and uh, it, was a, it was a design class that was focused on Afrofuturist work. And actually this was a design a studio that I was teaching at the University of Buffalo. And um, I started thinking about this idea of like how Derek Bell, who's one of the founders of critical race theory, or one of the, one of the similar figures in critical race theory, um, because critical race theory comes out of the law. And, and so, as you know, uh, the law basically is a series of stories and precedents. Precedent is just like, oh, this is a story that happened before. And if this story happens again, here's a story that we can refer to to actually understand this particular story. It's a system of stories, right? And, um, you know, so he, what he was positing is, are these different ideas? Like, well, what if this particular, what if aliens came to, the, to, to, to America and offered Americans, you know, the, the solution to all of their problems if they gave up all of all the black people in America? That's a story that he wrote called Space Traders that was thinking about the law. You know, that's a diegetic prototype. So uh, some other people that are really big uh, formative uh, influences on me, besides my friend Renaldo Anderson, are people like Sherry Renee Thomas, you know, who did this really uh, exhaustive work on, on research in, in Black history, uh, Black speculative history, called Dark Matter, right? A seminal work and a really influential person in my life on my type of work that I do. Kevin Young, the former director of uh, the Schomburg Center, um, he has this idea of the shadow book, which I find very fascinating. The idea of, the, of, a, of a book that's haunted by the existence of another book. For instance, um, Ralph Ellison's second novel, for instance, haunts the existence of the Invisible Man, you know, that idea. Or the third installment of, of, the, uh, of the parable series that, you know, Octavia Butler never got a chance to write because she, was, she had a writer's block and died before she could actually make the other one. Jenna Confer's Data Thief, of course, and Du Bois's constructions. I didn't add uh, the Megascope, but now it's like the veil, you know, the idea of the veil is described almost like an alternative space, right? It's like a fictional space. Um, and the Megascope he created in The Princess Steel is an object that, you know, actually helps you understand the veil to a certain degree. So that's actually some of the things that actually started me thinking about critical race design studies. And so this curatorial exercise uh, that I did with Ronaldo coupled with the exposure to concepts around speculative design, maybe start to thinking about race as a type of design fiction. Uh, we often refer to it as a system or a construct. We construct and consume space and race around it like it's a real thing. And I'm like, well, what if we looked at it like it's a design object or if we looked at it like it's a, a diegetic product, prototype that could be redesigned or, or undesigned? You know, how would that affect how we, how we look at it? You know, and so these are diegetic prototypes that actually are in you know, black literature. So this is uh, from Will the Circle Be Unbroken by Henry Dumas. This is 1966, this is in the heart of the black arts movement. He wrote about a, a musical instrument that, you know, the sound of the music was actually deadly to, to white people. They weren't safe from the music. It's a very interesting uh, 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 story. Uh, Mchawi by Amiri Baraka, this is 1990. Uh, what if there was a pair of shoes that allowed you to fly, right? That people could fly, right? Like Virginia Hamilton. Um, what if there was a chair that actually could make black people turn into white people, but not phenotypically. This is by this is Black No More by George Shiloh, 1931. This, this is a piece of science fiction that actually is using a diegetic prototype in the black fiction to talk about societal issues. That's that's speculative design by black people. That's wild. Uh, Pig detected by Amir, Amir Baraka in the year 2000, where he posits uh, a device that actually could detect, you know, a uh, plainclothes policemen. You know. Um, and also the megascope, of course, uh, that W.B. Du Bois created in The Princess Steel, that is a device that could see through space and time. This is written in 1909, actually. Let me go through these really quickly. We started making design fiction pieces, like you know, a warning piece for um, Ishmael Reed's Just Grew poster, uh, a cover for Theoretical Elevators, which is a, a book that actually is in uh, Colson Whitehead's The Intuitionist. It's a shadow book it's a, that's inside of another book. So we're like, oh, let's give it a cover. So these are just things that we would do to actually kind of like explicate some of these particular pieces. Even something like the intergalactic rap battle in Deltron, Deltron 3030, um, it's, a, it's a rap battle that's actually in a, in a hip hop song. And my friend Damien Duffy created a, a poster for that rap battle, that kind of thing. So what's happening is like these design fictions are giving through vernacular culture um, resonance because it actually has a visual aspect to them. So final thing I want to talk about right quick is um, 
the, the, the Schomburg's Black Comic Book Festival. We just had our 10th anniversary festival, right? And this is an event that was co-founded by myself, the great Jerry Kraft, the great uh, Deirdre Holman, and the amazing Jonathan Gales, right? This is what it looks like. The Schomburg, if you're a vendor, is not meant to hold a lot of people at once. So what they, they do is actually turn this, this, uh, this amazing Black space into a, a comic book convention. And so when students walk into this space, when people walk into this space, when Black people walk into this space, for two days, we are the default. For two days, we are the default. You walk into that space, it's the blickety blackest space on, planet, on the planet. Some of Langston Hughes' ashes are, are in an urn under a, a cosmogram of the Negro Speaks of Rivers, you know, that actually leads into a theater that's named after him. You can walk down the hallway and see an Aaron Douglas painting looking back at you. It's on Malcolm X Boulevard. It's one of the blackest spaces on the planet. You walk into this space and you see black creators making black characters. All these people are business people and it empowers you in a particular way, right? And it's something I think that, you know, people, um, that white people in the mainstream take for granted, right? Um, we don't get a chance to see that too much. And, and so in this particular space, now we served about 50, 60,000 patrons who come through these walls, you know, to look at this. And so what I'm getting at is that um, this is a design project. What ha what's happened is like, we realigned the self-awareness of over 60, no, over 50,000 people who now have to never know what it's, what, it's, what it's like to not be the central idea in a, stare, in a story. The stories are very important. And I'm gonna stop there because I could yammer away, but that's, that, that's what I, so that's, those are some of the things I'm working on right now. So if y'all have questions, let's, let's get to it. So I'm gonna stop share. Wow, that was amazing, John. Um, uh, thank we're you. going to open it up for questions from the audience. And uh, if we have some questions online, uh, we have people that will be reading those questions as well. No questions in the audience? If no one has a question, I have another question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so in, with today's political climate against uh, critical race theory and so forth, uh, how do you think that could possibly impact uh, critical race design? You know, it's interesting because I, I don't see it really affecting it that much because I think the people that are opposing it don't understand what they're talking about to start with. That's the first thing. Um, so <clears throat> the other thing is that um, I teach in this, uh, you know, on the university level where we actually are training folk to think critically about this work. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I think this was what's, what's probably going to happen is because what, what they're really doing is they're banning anything that's that's considered other or, or aberrant that isn't like of the mainstream or the Euro stream as Tertero on Lee calls it, right? This isn't critical race design study. This isn't critical race theory at all. This, this is just like ways to, to censor things that make you uncomfortable. Like, for, you know what I'm saying? And here's the thing though, you know, it, to me, if you censor things that make you uncomfortable, then that means you don't wanna learn because you only learn when you're uncomfortable. You only learn when you're uncomfortable. I've had to be uncomfortable for 51 years in this country. So for me, I really don't care what they do. I really don't care what they do. I'm not gonna stop making what I, what I make. You're gonna ban Mouse, a story about the Holocaust because of a couple of words, it's utterly ridiculous. So anyway, I, I really, yeah, I don't think it's gonna stop anything. I think it's a death get, I think it's, I think it's a, a death rattle. Mm. Uh, John, I, I have a question uh, as well. This is more on the idea of design. I, I never really looked at things the way you've explained it. So I have to, to really uh, begin to take this in. Um, but one thing that uh, came to my mind as you were speaking is that when you talk about design, uh, mm -hmm. that comes with functionality. That's exactly uh, right. Right. And all of the, the, the images that you've shown, I mean, they're very powerful images. And I know they do several things even in my mind. But what do you see as the ultimate functionality, not only just cerebrally, but also uh, how they manifest themselves out in, in our physical actions. 
Like, mm. what, 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 how would you speak to the functionality of what you do? Yes, you know, and I think I think just to kind of build upon, that's a great question because it kind of it kind of comes out of that last part where I was talking about like we are realigning black subjectivity. So I got this idea. I, I was watching the the amazing, the late great, you know, Bell Hooks, who was a huge influence on my my thinking, talking to Theaster Gate right and they were at the new school and i want to say that the aster i forgot which one of them had a residency <laughs> at, at the new school and uh and she was talking to the aster gates the aster gates uh, if you don't know his work he's a um, really really talented artist ceramicist uh, and, uh he's based in chicago and what he was doing he was actually taking the uh the work that he was you know, the, the money that he was making from his work and he was buying uh, a property and then he was turning them into public spaces right Mostly like, you know, on the south side of Chicago, things like that, these beautiful refurbishments and, and making these uh, these buildings for public use, right? But he's a, you know, he's a potter, essentially. And so we were talking, he was, they were talking about the functionality of the Masters of Fine Arts, which is the degree that me and my friend Stacy both have. It's a terminal degree in art. It's kind of like having a doctorate in art, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he was talking about how, like, what that particular degree gives you is something that goes past medium, is actually something that really is more theoretical. You know, it's not just like I'm a painter, I'm a sculptor, I'm a, you know, I am a, uh, uh, you know, I'm a dancer, right? Um, what it gives you is a certain type of thinking about materiality and about how how different materials function, and then and also immater immateriality, right? And how like and as you're asking like how that immaterial thinking like manifests itself as a, as a as a deliverable, you know? Um, and so what he said to her was just it just stuck with me. He said, yeah, you know. It really is a, cer a certain way of thinking, but he said at the end of the day, I'm still making vessels, right? He's still making pots, <laughs> but he's making like, he's using buildings to make, to, to make vessels. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so when we're creating spaces and we're creating these design objects, we're, we're communicating um, that idea of empowerment, that idea of like power, that idea of, of the complexity of what it means to be black in, in the world, you know? um through our designed work you know when people i'm hoping that when people walk away from a black kirby show or from uh you know one of these one of these events that we put together that they take with them that sense of awe wonder you know you know the, the work that stacy makes is gorgeous i don't know if you've seen his collage work but it's like ridiculously empowering to see uh, the, that work, you know, <laughs> I know, love you too, babe, love you too, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah, so, so it's like, it's like seeing, um, it's like seeing yourself in a way that you had never really imagined, you know, and it's, to, and, and so I think at the end of the, it's, it's not, it's not about the object that you take away, it's about that, that, that intensity of curiosity, like when I teach a class, you know, to me, you know, the students want to come there for an A, right, they want to come there and get an A, but what I want to give them is a un insatiable amount of um, curiosity, you know. So I think that's what it is to be curious about yourself, because so much of us of our history has been disrupted and hidden from us on purpose, you know. Mm -hmm. That's the design, you know. That's on purpose, you know. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I hope that hope that, did that answer your question. I feel like I was. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> you, you answered a lot of things. <laughs> it, it answered it. Thank you very okay, much. Good. We have another one from the audience. Okay. Yes, uh, we actually have quite a few questions from the online audience. So this is a, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, so are most of these dystopian? You know, that's a good question. Because I honestly think about dystopian. I think about, I think about like the present. I think about these spaces. I don't think of them as dystopian. I think they might be, if anything, uh, warding, trying to ward off dystopias, you know. I'm very much in the vein of of the, of the late great Octavia Butler that she's not trying to make, um, you know, predictions. She's trying to stop something from happening, you know. So if anything, they're warnings, right? Like like she makes. Um, but you have the other thing you have to understand is that we are that black folk in this country are already in a post apocalyptic state, right? Like Sunrise states, it's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? That's what he's getting at. Like we already live in a post-apocalyptic state. So if anything, they're aspirational, you know? And, um, you know, I, I, the other thing is they're cathartic for me because um, 
you know, I have to figure out a way to survive, right? Art is a survival technology for me. Thank you for that. Another question from an anonymous attendee is uh, what artists influenced you to make this style of art? Oh, wow, that's a great question. You know, so many, you know, uh, I'm classically trained artist, you know what I'm saying? So I'm, I was, I love like Cezanne. I was really, one of my favorite artists is uh, Egon Shiu, you know? Um, I'm really a big fan of Otto Dix, uh, but I'm also really into uh, a lot of the works from, um, from the Harlem Renaissance, you know? Like Palmer Hayden, William Johnson, uh, Louis Melu Jones, Aaron Douglas, and but also comics. I, I'm a big comics fan, so people like Bernie Wrights and Dennis Cowan, um, Bill T uh, Ben Temple Smith, uh, you know Steve Ditko. So I'm like com 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 combining all of this work into one kind of like framework. But I tell you, I I'm really influenced by a lot of printmakers too, like Franz Masriel, Lynn Ward, um, Tom Kovacs, uh, and also people like. Um, Oh, what does it say? Kathy Kowitz, for instance, too, because these artists were actually trying to capture emotion through art, you know, through the the, the line. So, so I kind of like work like a printmaker. A lot of people think I'm a printmaker because of that, but I'm, you know, I'm making things digitally, but I'm really trying to get across that aesthetic. So those are visually, those are some of my just a kind of a general. Oh, oh, and um, oh, what is his name? Uh, man, Ted McKeever. Ted McKeever is also a big a big influence too. And uh, another question we have from the Q&A, uh, this is from Jennifer Evans from the United Arts of Central Florida. Mm. Uh, she asked, as a grant maker to artists and arts organizations, how can we support this work? How do we help race as a design construct? Mm. That's a good question too. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm not really sure because I don't know enough about the arts grants and how they function, but maybe creating creating grants that actually like, because because I think a lot of times grants are about specificity, right? Like this grant is specifically for this thing. So I guess like design, um, design a grant that's actually for the thing that's, that you need, you know, right? Is, is that, I don't even know how it works, honestly. I don't know enough about it. <laughs> but just like the symposium is specific, I think you can make uh, a grant or some type of uh, action that's specific. I mean, because a lot of times you're creating grants to, to sort of, to, to, to uh, to, to feed a need, correct? It's a call and response kind of thing. I see this thing happening. Here's a grant to deal with that thing. Is that, or am I making that up? I don't know. But yeah, but I think that's what it is. Just really be specific about what you want, you know, and then invite people to apply, you know? But my, the way that I think about this stuff is very particular to, how, to my training and how I move through the world. But I don't know if it's actually like <laughs> viable for, for other artists to work, to think like that, but you know, I'm a, I'm a I'm an amalgam of, a, of various types of trainings and, and and I mean so many things that actually like color the way I think about my own work is very particular to me you know so I don't know I feel like I half answered it did I half answer that I don't even know I'm tired <laughs> is that um is that in why it is she yes and I have a question yes it's in wine theory how you doing and uh, let me give a shout out to Jennifer Evans. Uh, who is the CEO, the person that just asked that question. She is a new uh, CEO and president of United Arts of Central Florida. It's very exciting to know that uh, she's on this, um, on this session. Thank you. Um, the genius of your work, the genius of your work, I think, is that, at least for me, is that you are able to draw people in uh, in a way that is so accessible now, it may be that I'm just, uh, that this is something that's being said from an, an older person, but I am curious about two things. Um, because it looks like comics, because it's, it's so graphic um, that the way that it's presented, the material is presented, uh, is so accessible. Um, the question I would have is uh, two things. One, is there a narrative? Is there actually um, a compendium to Black Kirby so that when people, for example, come into the Hurston, they are very interested in, they're very interested in how the work, you know, what it means and how it came about. Is there um, a, literally a compendium that would um, help them to understand what 
is a message from each. And then the other thing before you answer that, um, it is interesting that you say that you are, you know, you're classically trained. It's like the jazz musicians. In other words, to go to the level that you are in your art builds upon a certain tradition. And I just want to uh, say how grateful we are to have Black Kirby in the Hurston. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. You know, um, <clears throat> I think the closest uh, companion we might have is, is our catalog of, of the first show. Um, Stacy has been going, has been graciously, graciously going through the work and writing about it in a particular way, uh, particularly about like our practice of what we call um, creating what we call a, a, a illustrated syllabus or, or the illibus, right? So, because a lot of things that we want to do is actually um, really rethink how people are taught. So when you walk into one of our shows, the, the shows that we've been doing, the experimental shows we've been doing at Riverside, for instance, have been around like Black masculinity, but we, we, we're we using, um, you know, hip hop and art and comics and things like that to kind of get at these questions and stuff. And, and so we actually have like a, a a, a lesson plan that's embedded in the show, you know, and we actually have a, a bibliography that's installed in the show. So when you walk into the space, you get a bibliography, you get you get points for like a from like a ten to sixteen week class, and you and you read the images as text. So <clears throat> what we might have to do eventually is go through and 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 Stacy started doing this too with the catalog for it for the show uh, the Zoe the Zoe Hurston uh, space. Um, is to really kind of like create that narrative and, and, distra and describe, you know, what's going on in the places, in the pieces. And what's interesting about it is that that's usually not acts of less didactic work, right? I mean, a lot of times when you go to a museum, you're supposed to, you're supposed to project what you think is the artist is being saying, but we're actually very specific about the thing. So of course, you know, you feel like you have to have an index. We have a lot of inside jokes. We have a lot of samples. We think like hip hop artists, like as you said, jazz musicians, we're riffing off of things that we've come up with and uh, making these really, really wild connections, you know, and, and, you, and you have like what they call deep cuts, right, <laughs> you know, of, uh, of things that are in there, you know, um, that are particular to, you know, men of a certain age, right, you know, we're, we're at a very similar in age. So we're thinking about our Blackness and our, and, our, and our world in a particular way that, you know, younger generation might not. So you're right, there needs to be some type of way to kind of get through some of those things, and maybe we'll, maybe that should be a project that we engage with soon. I'm very grateful for your comments, and I'm also extremely humbled uh, by the amount of attention and um, interest in the things that we've been doing. I'm really grateful for that. Hi, my name is Richard Reap, and I'm an architect. And I taught. Um, but you, something you said at the very beginning reminds me of a book I used when I taught design mm. by Ann Thorpe. And she says that most, not all, but most social, economic, and political problems can be boiled down. And at their essence, they're actually design problems. Yes. And in the book I used with the students, we tried, the book actually urges a call to action for students to become design activists. And there you go break the whole contract that, you know, the architect takes a commission from a patron and then executes a design. And it's like this, this private exchange and create a public activism where you actually seek out a problem, create a design solution, mm -hmm. and then implement that through grants, through, you know, crowdsource funding, through right. other means. I'm curious in your, it's what's happening now. Are you seeing that swell any? Is that something that you're you're seeing in your practice and are there others doing the same thing? You know, I, I would say, yes. I, I would say that, you know, everything revolves around, thank you for your question, it's wonderful. Um, there's this, uh, uh, this idea that we come across as well later on called it the idea of the citizen designer, right? And so that's what, what, I, um, what I think that a lot of us you know, when I was in, when I was still teaching design at like at U of I and UB, I was trying to create a syllabus or create a design experience or design a, a, a class that would result in a citizen, a well-informed citizen who happened to be a designer, right? And so, and so the citizenship came first, and then the practice of designing and thinking, you know, was something that I thought, you know, was just a way to kind of like enact your citizenship, you know. 
so yes, and, and of course, with like people who are dealing with like redesigning ideas around the prison industrial complex, or how do we actually deal with that issue? Uh, thinking about global warming, thinking about sustainable issues. You know, these are things that are like really, really massive design problems that you know artists and designers should be in the, in the, in the room talking about. You know, and thinking about architecture in particular. Oh my God, just things that you can do. You know, um, it's really important aspect of design, right? And the other thing too is not to segregate the you know the design thinking methods too, because we're all thinking about planning. You know, we're just manifesting those designs in different materials in different ways, but it's really about like you know, the human condition and how uh, our society affects the world. So yes, these, I think these have to be dealt with, you know, hoping that they are. I have to say that I felt like I had to move out of the art and design uh, uh, area to actually really, really get at what I really want to do. Because sometimes, and, I, and you probably know this, there can be um, a lot of limitations in these art schools and things, right? Because of the fact that we're fighting against these tried and true methods that we think work, you know, but, but are really old ways of thinking about things. And so I used to tell my students that I don't teach in a design program, I teach in a, in a, in a design D program. Because <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to deprogram you from thinking about old ways of making, right? And so, yeah. And uh, no, but that's a great question. I, I think that I'm hopeful. I, I think that, you know, that, that with a little bit of, uh, with a little bit of work and, and some solidarity that we can actually change things, you know? And I think that these narratives uh, these speculative narratives that we work on are really like kind of proof of that. But um, yeah, I'm hopeful. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Oh, okay. Hi. Oh, sorry. Um, I was thinking about like your concept of naturalizing ideologies through creation mm. and about that being a design concept. And that made me want to try and understand well, if we can plan and design but how and where do we perform these design concepts in like white spaces? Mm, that's a great question, you know. Um, it's interesting about that because, you know, if you think about the, the ultimate white space is a blank canvas, right? It's, a, it's an empty piece of paper and it doesn't become useful or active until, until you know, it's activated by like, you know, something, something black, some, something that's usually as text or space, you know, um, these things play off of each other, right? Um, it's a difficult question because, you know, we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a collective of systems, not just one system, but these inter interlocking systems, and to figure out a way to actually create um, your own space within those, within those, uh, those white spaces. Because I, f I feel that most of the change that's happened in our country around like being Black in this country has been through coalitions and through making, making your own space. There are conferences, there are like coalitions and coalition building uh, that is happening. Like Black Designers United, for instance, is a space, it's a new space online. You know, space is actually, a, it's, it's a concept, right? It's not necessarily, a, right? It's, it's not about the physicality, right? It's a, it's a mental place, it's a, it's a theoretical place. So we have a vast network of creators out there now. I think I'm, I'm really on the feel the dreams kind of mentality, build it in, and they will come, right? So I would say like, you know, go and build something on the, on the net, on TikTok or wherever it needs, needs it to exist. And hopefully it'll start to attract like-minded individuals. I, I've seen that happen a million times. So I think that's where you start, the most visible, the most visible spaces. You know, where, where are these people living? Um, the Black Experience in Design is about to come out, you know, from NY, I think it's NYU Press, uh, where it's a bunch of us who are talking about these issues and what it means to be Black in this space. And of course, there's also like the, the, the I think they've done two symposia, like where are all the black designers or something like that. It, it was this really great, like interactive um, online space. There, there's stuff out there. There's people out there who are trying to, to make, these, uh, make these spaces happen. So I would say do your research, figure out who's already doing it and then create spaces where you can, um, where you can, you can help out, you know? Cause you're right, it is difficult. You know, it is difficult you know, to be, uh, as, they, as uh, Archie Boston called the, the fly in the buttermilk, so to speak, you know? It's a lot easier now for us though, I think. Because we're just way more connected. We have a few questions from our online audience. So Terry Vismail Vis Morris wants to know uh, if a documentary regarding Black Kirby is in the works. Um, if there is, we don't know about it. <laughs> right? 
They say, is someone filming you? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think anybody is. I don't know, we've been kind of under the radar. I mean, we've been, we've been in the middle of this, this movement of black artists across the world, but we've been making a lot of moves quietly, you know? And I, you know, so yeah, I, that would be awesome, I guess. I'd, I'd love to do something like that, but no, not that I know of. And uh, Colin Deer has two questions. Uh, first, have you ever worked for a major comic book company such as Marvel, DC, or Dark Horse? And uh, what is the graphic novel you had the most fun creating? Um, <clears throat> so right now, uh, I'm doing work with it, with Marvel. You know, I can't really talk about what that is, but you know, so that's that's actually something that's actually working right, working now. The most fun I've had on a graphic novel, it might have been Kid Code, actually. It's not, it's a graphic novella. It's something that me and Stacy and Damian Duffy did together as Tan Lee. You know, it's a hip hop time travel story. That was a lot of fun to make, actually, you know, because it, it brought us together as a collective, but also it really kind of like helped us think about our processes differently and, and, what, and what we bring to the table. So I would say Kid Code Channel Zero is probably one of my favorite um, comics that we've made. Yeah, kid code. Yeah. Are there any more questions from the audience? I don't have to talk now, so I think my wife has a little errand. <laughs> so I gotta go get the kids. Thank you. Um, so I was curious about when you were discussing, um, you made a statement that when we're uncomfortable, we learn. Yeah. And I will, like I'm just thinking about my existence and my parents would teach me to not make whiteness uncomfortable, like to make the law uncomfortable can result in backlash and lashing out on like blackness itself. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, how do you grapple when you make art with making things potentially too uncomfortable for certain spaces and then those spaces lashing back on you? I like I don't necessarily know if that happens, but if it does. It has, I've been very fortunate it hasn't happened yet, you know. The, the racialized aggressions that have happened to me have been through like um, our brothers and sisters or brothers uh, succumbing to self-hate, you know, honestly. So, I mean, going up in Mississippi, you know, uh, post-civil rights era Mississippi, you know, I think a lot of the, the violence that happened to me was because of just uh, frustration, you know. Um, but to your question, um, I, I try not to live in fear to think about that. You know, I, I have to make the thing that I need to, you know, or, I, or I'm not living my true self. You know, I, I know that we have to plan out these things. I think I'm a little bit more trepidatious about it now because I'm a, I'm a father of a black boy, you know, and, and, and the things I make are, will probably affect him in some way. But um, I don't know, I, I just, I have to make, I have to make the work that I make. I feel it's vital, you know, and sometimes, sometimes it's dangerous uh, to do that. I mean, James Baldwin often stated that to be committed is to be in danger. You know, we, we are in a space of, of, um, of alarm in this country, you know, and a lot of times the arts are side by side with these particular types of political movement. We've seen it happen over and over again. We're fighting for our lives. So it's like, you know, if you're in a fight, how can you be safe? <laughs> you know, you try to defend yourself, you know. It frightens me, you know. But um, I, I feel like a part of me will die if I don't make the thing that I need to make. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, you know, I don't think it does. <laughs> but that's how I feel about it. It's like I, I'm compelled to do the things that I do. Your words are impactful, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, beautiful questions. So we're going to end uh, the Q and A. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, no, John. thank you so much. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and and one final plug for the Black Kirby exhibit at Hurston. Um, you know, go and see it. And even if you're not uh, a student of history, if you're not a student of comics, and if you're not a student of hip hop, uh, which I find it hard to believe anybody in here don't know something about any of those, <laughs> uh, you will, uh, you'll walk away from the show with so much information. 
Uh, and I wanted to thank you and Stacy for putting that, putting the work together and for Julie and Chambliss for curating it. I've been there twice now and I, I'm going, going to go back again. Each time I go, there is something new uh, that I walk away with. So please go and see the Black Kirby exhibit. Thank you for that. Um, we had one quick question. Uh, could you please repeat the dates of the 10th anniversary at UCR? Um, um, some people in the chat were curious. To so know. there's a virtual there's a virtual aspect that's going to be up probably next week because we're doing um, a couple of shows in the 10th anniversary show. And we're also celebrating the work of Larry Fuller, the creator of Eben, which is one of the first Black independent comic books in history. Um, we, we basically, we're trying to give Brother, Brother Fuller his flowers, you know what I'm saying, because he, he was an innovator. Is, is an innovator. Um, so we actually have now, uh, because of this crazy virus, we've had to push back the show. And I think that we're looking at, um, say, they say a March opening, it's March or April, right? You know, so it's because of some of the people were fabricating, you know, some of the fabricators got sick and stuff like that. We had, uh, the Culver had to push it back, but um, it's probably going to be late March, I'm thinking, like March 26, something like that. Looking at April, you know, okay, but it'll be this spring. It'll be in the spring, so they're, they're still dedicated to doing it, and we're in, a, we're in a, a strong partnership with them, so they're going to definitely be doing the show. Uh, we'll try to get you information as soon as we know a definite uh, date. Great, thank you so much, and 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 thank. I see Stacy Robinson's on screen here. I'm seeing him up front here. So I thanks to both of you. Uh, of, just a powerhouse uh, day today. Thank you for taking the time to share all this with us. Um, we're just going to have a few last words, uh, but I want to give one more round of applause to John Jennings and Stacy Robinson. Thank you. Thank you. And so uh, that wraps up the program today. I wanted to thank all of the presenters over the past two days who made this such an enriching, exciting, invigorating uh, conference. I want to give special thanks to Julian Chambliss, who had the vision to create this Afrofuturism cycle uh, and, and to, to have the stamina to uh, push forward five seasons. This is season three. Uh, next, next is the, what is the spirit of Afrofuturism. So we're looking forward to that. We hope you'll all come back and join us for wow. that fourth season. And then the fifth is what is the space of Afrofuturism? And we will be sort of reaching back and looking over all five of our seasons in that fifth season. Um, Julian I, is not able to join us right now because he's doing important work and it is connected to Afrofuturism. Um, I wanna thank him as a, as a driving force behind this. We work very closely to make this happen. This has to be designed and there are a lot of hands in creating this. Uh, we have partners, our partners, preserve the association to preserve the Eatonville community and the Zora festival. This is very much a part of the festival. And a lot of the planning is done year round through our academics committee. And uh, you have um, been introduced to those members. You've seen a couple of very of, of those members up here. To, uh, I wanna thank Trent Tomengo for moderating today's sessions. Trent is uh, an artist and a, a, an active uh, participant in all of our activities, and I thank him for, for, for leading the discussion today so beautifully. I want to thank everybody who uh, asked questions uh, mm -hmm. via the chat, the question and answers, and Asmara Cortes for, uh, for, for bringing those questions to us. Um, she is a, gra a graduate student, MA student in our public history program. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank uh, Jesse Oldham for uh, our public history administrative assistant who has worked behind the scenes um, making sure that all of this, that the program goes up, that it gets updated when there were unexpected changes that we very quickly responded to that. Everything went beautifully. I, I'm always a worst case scenario guy, but everything was really best case all, all week. Um, I, I also wanna thank our students who showed up in, in the room here. Thank you to uh, our student who asked questions and, and being here with us. And we've had other students over the, the past two days who made their way down here uh, and made a special effort to get here. Um, we had classes that were invited to participate in this. They are writing, they are tweeting it. They're not actually live tweeting it because I didn't want them to feel that they had to go out in public with it, but to practice with that. And they're going to be, um, as their assignment, uh, submitting the tweets. And some were asked of you. Uh, one of the last questions that was asked today was from a student in my class. 
And I should mention that class is a direct outgrowth of this conference. It's Afrofuturism and the Hurston legacy. Uh, NY and a theory really encouraged us to, to go forward with making the conference, uh, to giving it another, bringing it to another level, to, to make sure that the presentations don't just stop here, that they live on and that we can teach with them and, and engage students with, with the, the exciting ideas that are presented here each year. Uh, we have an Afrofuturism syllabus that records and, and preserves each year's, each, uh, each year's program. And uh, you can look at last year's program. All of those sessions are online. If you Google Afrofuturism syllabus UCF stars, you will find it. Um, we will do our best to get this year's program into that syllabus as quickly as we can. It does take some time to process. I wanna thank Ken Moore and his team uh, for being here for the past two days. Great job, thank you so much. And Ken is working already, working with us to, to turn those uh, recordings around so that we can, so that the students who couldn't attend, because not everybody can be here for, they have other classes, so that they can watch these and respond and engage with, the, with each other through the discussion. Um, and uh, I hope I've covered everybody. Oh, Tiffany, Tiffany Rivera, thank you. You, uh, Tiffany is also very important to the, the sort of unseen work that goes into making this. The minute Tiffany got on board and she's always on board, but when she really kicks in and gets the team going, it, it just takes all of your worries away. And it's been amazing. She keeps me calm all through it. Um, is there anything I've missed? I'm gonna ask you all, have I forgotten anything? Well, I will just say this, please keep supporting the, the PEC and the Zora Festival. Their outdoor festival has been moved to June. Uh, we invite you to follow their calendar on the Zora Festival website, zorafestival.org. And any updates will be posted there. If you need to reach us, uh, you can reach us. Uh, well, you can, I, my name is Scott French and you can find my uh, email at the UCF History Department website. Um, Julian Chambliss is also somebody, but, but anything to do with sort of the, the, the conference, please feel free to contact any of us and the message will get, we'll get, a, we'll get you an answer. So with that, I want to thank everybody for a just wonderful two day conference and, and, uh, we're really excited to keep this going. Let's, let's do this again next year. Thank you.